So to start, I was reading in the press notes, I have it here because I knew I wasn't going to remember it. It was some sort of quote that Donald gave, and it was along the lines of, critics love to discover talent, but then it's no longer about the shock of the new. It's about what you're doing now and whether it is like what you were doing before. So mm. I wonder, four films in now, are you feeling that at all? I don't know, it's interesting. It's often, oh, I haven't heard that quote. I remember hearing this quote from Quentin Tarantino once where he said that in America, this is about judgment, I guess, in different countries, but he said in America, it's um, you're only as good as your most recent film, whereas in like France, and he said you're as good as your best film. And I think there's that, I think there's that weird pressure of are you being judged for your quality or for how something's performed, or I think it's a, a weird... I think it's a weird thing for someone who's a filmmaker or any kind of artist to, to live in that kind of in that kind of paradigm. I think you sort of have to just try to remove yourself, put yourself in a vacuum of what is the story that you're telling and how do you best tell it and not think about any of that stuff too much. It's hard, right? Especially when there's the internet. Oh, that's for sure. Yeah. How about your relationship with Donald? I love that he was your professor and then you went on to work together. Is that like, did something kind of spark between the two of you while you were in class and you knew you'd carry on with him? Um, no, I, did. I mean, he was an amazing teacher. My father was a college professor for over 30 years. So great respect for great um, teachers. And Donald really was a mensch. I mean, he was just great to everyone in the class and really listened to them and tried to understand what they were doing and tried to suss it out of them and, and nudge them in whatever direction they were trying to go in this fumbling undergraduate way. Um, and we did stay in touch over the years. Um, I would see his plays and then he saw some of my movies and um, I, I just really liked him. I don't know that one can always, at least I can't, haven't always been able to predict which teachers I would stay in touch with. I know the ones that I like. Um, they see so many people. Um, but yeah, when, when Donald reached out, um, you know, about this, I was really thrilled because I was a huge David Foster Wallace fan. And, and um, you know, it was exciting and felt like something had come full circle. I mean, it felt like Oh, wouldn't it be lovely if every teacher-student relationship spanned a decade plus? That would be a really nice thing. It would be a very encouraging reason to go to film school. Exactly. There you go. <laughs> Jesse was telling me a little bit about having to finance this and that it was a little bit of a challenge and that he had to make a video with Jason. <laughs> yeah. Can you tell me about how that worked and how you got what you needed? Yeah, we, uh, it's funny. Um, yeah, no, there was, um, Jason and Jesse had never met before. Um, they did this film, they hadn't worked together, obviously, as well. And, um, yeah, to help sort of get the financing and foreign financing, etc. Um, I think there was an interest in seeing them together and seeing what their chemistry would be. Um, from some of the financiers and whatnot, so they were really, really gracious and made this sort of, and just, you know, in front of the camera sort of answered some questions and talked a little bit, and it was really funny and thoughtful and engaging, and there was certainly a promise that it would never, never be seen by except for a handful of people would not wind up on the internet, so it was pretty amazing that they did that, and they were very generous. The first thing that popped up my mind is that it would be a great DVD extra. <laughs> it might be. I don't know. They might They might hate it. I don't know. I think it was really weird. It was before we shot the movie, obviously. So it was, it was super early, and it was Jesse as Jesse, Jason as Jason. But talking about these characters, it was very, very meta. How do you go about casting something like this? Because obviously anybody in the world would want Jason and Jesse in their movie, and you probably have to offer them the parts. But at the same time, it's such a delicate relationship between the two of them, and you got to make sure they have that chemistry. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I usually. I mean, I, I watch. I watch everything. I try to. I'm pretty democratic, um, omnivorous in like what I consume as far as TV and film, big studio stuff, independent form, whatever. I'm just. I've seen most everything Jesse and Jason have done. Like I'm a fan. Like that's where I start from. I'm a fan. And I imagined the chemistry that they would have, you know, I thought it would be really exciting. Um, I met with them individually, and got a better understanding of who they were as people, aside from who they were as actors, and I felt like there would be something really compelling. I mean, these guys aren't playing old friends or brothers, they're playing strangers who meet for the first time, and there's an innate tension. To, to that, to the being strangers, being journalists and subject, and something of a burgeoning friendship developed. But really, what was going to happen in real life needed to happen on, on, on camera. Um, so I was actually okay with the fact that they didn't already know each other or anything like that. And when they first did meet, it was very clear they had very different energies, but very quick, very intelligent minds. Um, and I felt like their own relationship um, yeah, would, would grow while we were filming, which it did. How is it dealing with the script with them? Because it's a, a very verbose script, and you know, it's one thing to just say a line; it's another to really like understand what you're saying. And I think that's vital in a movie like this. So, did you really have to parse through it more so than other ones? You know, Jesse and Jason. I mean, it's worth noting that they're both very 
yeah. thoughtful, intelligent, and successful writers. Jesse has a play in New York right now, and New Yorker pieces. Jason right now is writing the second Legos movie, revived the Muppet franchise, wrote Forgetting Sarah Marshall. Like, they think like writers, and they happen to be great actors. So, for them, there was no problem whatsoever. They're smarter than me about that. They're smarter than most people. Like they, they understand what makes a scene work and doesn't, what their character needs, where there's plot holes, where there's things like, they ask all the right questions. So they were the best possible collaborators to have. Did they make any changes to the script? Or did it pretty much stay the same from script to screen? It stayed the same. I mean, they were both incredibly respectful. Like, I mean, I always... I love creating an environment where actors can improvise, um, where they can try whatever they want. Jason and Jesse were very respectful in this case because Donald wrote a beautifully beautiful script and it was based on an actual conversation. Um, you know, where things changed, a lot of times it was what we could omit. You know what I mean? It was the type of thing where it's an independent film so there wasn't a ton of time or money. You know, so sometimes in talking to them about different scenes and things like that, sometimes it was never... It was never like, hey, can I give a monologue about this? It was more, you know, I bet if you're pressed for time, you could maybe, you know, end that scene there. It might save you some time and you might not lose anything, which is a really thoughtful, helpful thing because they were right. I mean, they, you know, additionally thought like producers. It was really in the service of maximizing the time that we had on the scenes that really were important. Speaking of, like, the producing and financing angle, how do you go about making this kind of a universal oh, yeah, film? Because I had never read any of David Foster Wallace's book, but I still took a lot from the movie, and yeah. I, I might have looked up Infinite Jest, then I looked at yeah. the page count, and yeah. I'm like, I'll save that for later. But, you know, how do you respect his fans, but also bring in newcomers, or maybe even people that have no interest in reading what he wrote and just want to watch a good movie, too? Yeah, that was, I mean, that was always the litmus test for me and everyone else who worked on the movie, was that if you need to know David Lipsky or David Foster Wallace's writing to appreciate the film, then we failed. Um, it's totally yeah, inside baseball. Um, so, I mean, we wanted to get the details right. I mean, David Lipsky is a first-rate journalist. His book, you know, which came out five years ago, was an acclaimed book, and it was the basis for Donald Margulies' script. Um, so, you know, it's a very subjective story. It's about David Lipsky. The story's about David Lipsky and how he's affected by his time with Wallace. So that's all we tried to, to tell was that amount of time, you know, as and David Foster Wallace from, through the eyes of David Lipsky. And so that was something we thought that we could try to tell truthfully and get the details right. But, I mean, as far as focusing on the universal, you know, we didn't want it to be a talking heads movie with two smart guys just talking about oh, movies and music to each other which it is but I mean hopefully it is more than that and for me on a very um, on, a, on a deeper level it's a story it's an unrequited platonic love story you know it's about someone who goes to get a story and then realizes what an affinity they have for this other person that they sort of want what this other person has and they're sort of measuring themselves against this other person I think there's something very universal in being a fan of someone from afar or just someone who from a distance you've kind of conceptualized, idealized, romanticized you know whether that's someone whether that's an artist or whether that's an estranged relative or an ex-boyfriend or girlfriend I think we've all had that thing where we get five minutes with them an hour with them a day with them and their own messy humanity compli complicates that time That's what I just asked Jesse about if he had anybody that was like that kind of person in his life where you romanticize them and then you meet them in person and you actually see, you know, just like what happens in their daily life and those kinds of complications. Do you have anyone what, what like he, that? What did he say? He mentioned Woody Allen because he had just worked with him and he mentioned a, uh, I believe it was a basketball player. Okay. And he, he was surprised how, how into his films that he was. Cool. But like even like, I think especially actors, because you know, you watch them play these characters and it's so perfectly cut on screen too. It's yeah. like, it, it is almost hard to look at them and assess them as real people yeah. when you're only seeing them in the movies. Absolutely. Absolutely. Totally agree. Is there anyone in your life that you've met that you've idealized and then has surprised you in any respect? Um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I sometimes I write for a film magazine called Filmmaker Magazine, um, and I've gotten to interview directors who I really admire, whether that's like Charles Burnett or Kelly Reichardt or Paul Thomas Anderson or Werner Herzog. Um, you know, those are those are several filmmakers who I just deeply, deeply admire their films and other films inside and out, and in all of those cases, they were really wonderful people. You know, where I, I wish that instead of 45 minutes, I had a day with them and where I was like, oh man, I can be friends with them or something, you know, there's something which is very much what this film deals with. It's very easy to get blurry when you love someone's work so much, you think you know them and then you spend time with them and if they're a good person, in addition to that, it's, it's easy to sort of 
fall for them. How is it balancing their relationship in terms of it being a friendship and then all the mistrust that comes up? Because I imagine you didn't get to shoot in order and it's, I mean, it's not even like a straightforward arc even where they start out great friends and then it's the mistrust and then they're friends again <laughs> in the end. So do you have to kind of break down your script really meticulously and figure out what beats mean to hit when? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I do. And with the actors, I do. And, you know, it was very important that it's not just a meet cute and then there's a central betrayal, and then, a what, you know, it's not that, because it's, at the end of the day, it's a journalist with a subject. They're both writers. David Foster Wallace was also a nonfiction writer. He did celebrity profiles as well. Like, they both knew the game that they were playing and the stakes of it. Um, and so, to some degree, it's hard for us to know how much someone is being honest versus performing at any given time. I mean, like, right now, here with you, I'm trying to be... The I'm movie trying, made me so yeah, self-conscious, because right, I'm like, right. now i got to interview these guys, and that's what I'm thinking about. Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to be honest, I'm trying to be candid, I'm trying to not say something I've said before, but I'm also aware that this will be seen, heard, whatever, and I'm, you know, and I, I don't want to look like an idiot, and, you know, and probably if, if we had, like, ten hours or three days, there's more of a chance that I would look like an idiot. I would say something but, uh, stupid, because there'd be more footage um, but yeah hopefully that tension is what makes a good drama you know can you tell me a little bit about David Foster Wallace's house in the movie because there's just so much detail in there and I imagine there's detail that didn't get into the final cut of the film so is there any piece of the uh, production there that you hope people will either get to see in an extra or maybe keep an eye out for when they're watching the film <laughs> um, yeah well we had you know I was really lucky um, that I got to spend time um, um, in, in Bloomington Normal, um, and where he was living at this time and teaching at Illinois State. I got to spend time with some of his um, friends and colleagues who were in the English department with him, who um, just knew him really well during this entire period. Sort of showed me where he worked, where he ate, he took me to the house where he lived. The people that live there are very private, but they at least let me just kind of stomp around the outside. I saw photos of what it looked like from just when they moved in. I had seen photos from when Wallace lived there as well. So using all of these different things and working with a great production designer, Jerry Sullivan, who also like, most recently did me and All the Dying Girl. It's really great, has a, a real attention to detail and getting things honest. Um, you know, there was, and also, uh, you know, I had a lot of conversations with people that um, spent a lot of time with Wallace in that house at that time. Um, you know, there was a deep love for his dogs, for Jeeves and Drone. He was famously like loved um, like rescue dogs that he refused to discipline or couldn't discipline. So I'm they, a big dog person, so I feel uh, like when I immediately said like saw a character and dogs, I'm yeah. like, I like you. Yeah, I mean stuff like that, and, the do and what that is to have dogs that run over your house and eat all your good stuff. What it is to have those books. You know, there's different things. Whether it's certain postcards, certain quotes, things with from Whataburger or Chicago Cubs or Illinois State stuff. Things that were just specific to his world, the water jugs, the, the empty jars, bottles, things like that, that were just, um, that were part, part of part of his home. I mean, I, I think he lived in many ways, like I did before I met my wife, <laughs> like, like, a, like a, a bachelor who's not too concerned with keeping things neat, so, yeah. Can you tell me about your camera choice on this? You shot, you shot digital once, right? I did, on Smash, Smash. yeah, and this was on, yeah, this was on 3 perf 35 and sort of went to, it's, so it's, shown anamorphic, um, and there's a bit of grain to it, and um, worked with a really great Swedish cinematographer named Jakob Eri, who shoots with a filmmaker named Joachim Trier, they did a movie called um, a Reprise, and also August 31st, they went a can this year with Jesse called Louder Than Bombs, um, and Jakob's shot in the snow a lot, and um, you know, there was, there was I, I knew that I wanted a sort of handheld, but not too shaky, a very human breathing quality of the camera that feels like it's a character in the film, and it was very important to us that, I mean, for me it's, I don't like traditional biopics, so there's nothing objective about this movie, it's very, very subjective, it's from David Lipsky's point of view, so you really see that when these guys finally meet, when Lipsky pulls up to Wallace's house, you know, ten minutes in the movie, you're seeing Wallace from Lipsky's point of view, you're seeing Lipsky sort of objectify um, Wallace, slowly it becomes more of a visual two-hander, but I think you're always aware, for the most part, that you're seeing it through the idea, through, through the eyes of, of Lipsky. You definitely do see the whole story through his eyes, but at the same time, like you also still need to feel how David Foster Wallace is feeling yeah. by being interrogated by yeah, him. Absolutely. But of course, you can't really do that. So, is there anything that you did to kind of bring that out and still, you know, make it feel 
as accurate as I guess it could be. For me, when it comes to camera design of the movie, I mean, I'm always asking, like, whose scene is it? You know, yeah. like, who, whose scene it is really big one. What, whose scene is it, and what is this scene about at a deep, primal level? I mean, usually it's about power and a struggle for power. Um, but once I ask myself whose scene is it, and, and what's the emotional truth of this scene, in addition to the pure, like, journalistic truth of it, but what's the emotional truth of it? Hopefully that defines where the camera goes and when it when it's wide, when it's close, when it's dirty, when it's clean, etc. Um, you know, generally speaking, it was seeing Wallace from Lipsky's point of view, but there were moments when we really needed to feel with Wallace. I think I think you feel because um, Jason, I mean, Je Jesse as well as all the other actors, but Jason really gives a deeply vulnerable, honest, powerful performance. It's also just so easy to side with such a nice guy like that. It's almost like innate to just immediately like him the second you meet him. Absolutely. Like a talented guy with a good heart. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree, yeah. All right, I just got the wrap-up sign, oh. so I wanted to ask you about an upcoming project that I'm really excited about. Another book that is now sitting on my iPad mm -hmm. and I'm waiting to read is The Circle. Oh, cool. And I got all <laughs> pumped about it, because like I, I wrote up a news story where it's you, Tom Hanks, and Alicia Vikander, and I got so psyched, and then, of course, the news came in that she's doing Assassin's Creed and Bourne, so I'm like, is that situation kind of, you know, the big Hollywood movie rolling <laughs> and stealing your actress. <laughs> yeah, it was, you know, I mean, she's like any really great actor. She's got a million things, as she should. Um, and it just comes down down to timing. I mean, we're still going to make the movie in the time frame that we talk about, but with, uh, with a different actor. And um, I, I love Alicia. She's great. But I'm super excited. We'll be shooting in September and October. So. That's very exciting. Yeah, yeah. So did you go after uh, Emma, Watson. Emma Watson? Emma Watson, yeah. Yeah. I think that's a perfectly I, fine. I mean, I'm, I'm a <laughs> massive, massive fan of Emma. She's one of my favorite, favorite actors. And um, I mean, when we were first talking casting, I didn't think that it would work out timing-wise because she's been doing Beauty and the Beast. But it's sort yeah. of um, when we shifted and when we realized their schedule, we realized that it would be a possibility. Um, I mean, I would get scared any time. I was like working on a tight schedule where someone's doing a huge, huge movie yeah, like that. My wife and I are actually having a kid later in the fall, so it's a super tight window for a lot of professional reasons and personal reasons, but in this case it looks like it's going to work, so I'm excited. It's like bringing two babies into the world at <laughs> two, once. Two babies at once, there you go. <laughs> I know another trend I see a lot are directors doing independent, you know, character-driven movies, and then a big studio snatches them up and puts them on maybe Jurassic World or a Star Wars movie. Mm -hmm. Have you encountered any of that, and would you consider it? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm open to anything. I mean, a lot of my friends have made those movies. My friend Colin made Jurassic World, and it was, um, you know, for him, we had movies at Sundance the same year. He had, I had a movie called Smash, when he had Safety Not Guaranteed. He's someone that, like, in a very deeply sincere way, you know, loves old Amelin movies from the 80s, and really that was a movie that, I mean, I think Jurassic World is a very personal movie for him, you know, and something he was super excited about. I think if there was that story for me that I was excited to tell and would be excited to, like, think about 24 hours a day for three years, um, if, it, if it was something that size, sure, absolutely. I'm not really a snob about it, and I don't think about size, it's like, am I interested in the story, how much money do we need to tell this story? And then I really could care less whether it's at a studio or independent, you know, um, independently financed. Is, is it a good story? That's really what it comes down to me. Is there any old movie that you would like jump at the opportunity to remake? To remake? I, for me, like, the remake thing is a tough thing. I generally, the rule that well, I don't know, this is a dumb rule that I'm kind of pulling out of my ass right now, but is I think really great movies don't need to be remade. I think I think there's a place for movies that had a great idea where for whatever reason the execution was slightly flawed or there was maybe a miscast or something. But I think making a really remaking a really great movie, you're always gonna be living in the shadow of that if you wanted to remake the Wizard of Oz or something, right? I don't know, like, you're going to be living in the shadow of a masterpiece, and who wants to be compared to that? I, I wouldn't. Um, I mean, I like the idea of, you know, one one thing inspiring something else or adapting something else in some way, and even sequels could be great. Godfather 2 is one of my favorite movies, but um, purely remaking a great movie. I don't know that I would, I would want to take that on. That's totally fair. <laughs>